All right, here's a battery, battery isolator, right, this device here. And you've got an alternator. Now, the alternator will never really output more than it should. These two batteries, notice the arrows, they're directional. Comes in from the alternator and goes either to one battery or the other. This is a great device. Yesterday, I was sharing my enthusiasm for this device. I love this device. This device, they used to be around, but they were diodes, and you lose 70% of your alternator output. Nowadays, you lose only 1%. I cannot tell you how I love this device. This device is miracle. Every boat should have one. They don't because they didn't exist a few years ago. A lot of actually French builders are putting them in now, like Jeannot, and they're putting them in. They're great because remember, French builders, most of them actually are making their boats for the charter market, and they'll never have a parallel switch between those two batteries, ever. They do not have a parallel switch. They just don't. They're like, it causes too much grief. Most owners always think that more is better, and they put all their boats in parallel. A Jeannot and a Beneteau do not come with a parallel switch. There is no ability to put your batteries in parallel. You carry jumper cables. They just don't. They're like, you know what? The operator causes more damage than what the battery switch can provide in terms of benefit. So they actually put these devices on board. And that's how they solve the problem of having one alternator on a sailboat charge multiple battery banks. Same thing on a Lagoon. They do the same device. They have that. French are crazy for those devices. I love it, by the way. This thing is, this is it. Every boat should have one. This is how you, ch this is how you share an alternator to multiple batteries. This is the way. But notice the builder has to take away the daisy chain. Remember we were talking about how the alternator typically is daisy chain to the starter sort of learned, right? Well, the manufacturer has to go, no, we're not doing that anymore. And they take the wire from the alternator and now they run it to the battery isolator. And then from the battery isolator, they go to one battery and then to the other. Every boat eventually will get there. It's just, there's a slow adoption rate. People are stubborn. But this is a perfect device. There is no downside to this device. Not anymore. You would, you would unlikely because the question would be, if you have a multiple output charger, you don't need to. The challenge is you might have a combiner if you have a single output inverter charger and you're like, well, this charges my batteries only when the alternator is running, but how do I get this battery to charge this battery when I have an inverter charger that's only connected to one battery? And then that's when you might have a combiner. You would solve that by putting a multiple output charger, like having a backup charger. You know those little Christec on the Genos and Benetos, those blue little, yellow little chargers that they have? They're multiple output chargers. That's how they solve this problem. Because their boats don't come with inverters stock. <coughs> the inverters are an add-on. So they're actually doing it great there. Great. It's perfect. It's, it's, it's like, it's rare that you have a perfect device. This is a perfect device. There is no compromise to this device. Ah, potentially, but I've never seen one break, like anything. But in terms of there's no fuses, the fuse will never blow. Because your alternator is always going to be whatever. This is rated for 100 amps. You rate the wire to handle 100. This is chosen to rate 100. This is rated to 100. You put a fuse that's maybe 125. You'll never have nuisance tripping. That's why I love it. It's, because the problem with fuses, right, if you go back to this thing, and I didn't, you know, this is, this is why I love what I do. Because you learn all the time. I was so excited about this. I didn't realize as the battery banks are getting bigger and bigger and you have large loads, you have nuisance tripping. And nuisance tripping is really hard on an owner because we're not Star Trek. Nobody's monitoring fuses on their boat. And if you're not monitoring voltage here, how the hell are you going to know that this battery is not getting a charge? And you might be blissful. You get on your boat and everything's so happy and you just don't worry. I get on my boat, I'm dialing things in, right? But most people aren't doing that. They're like, everything works until it doesn't. And it's not, not going to work. You just don't know that you lost suddenly the benefit of recharging your battery through a combiner. And eventually your battery, your thruster battery dies. And you're like, why is my battery thruster battery at three volts? And it's a golf cart or it's a Group 31 AGM, $400 a piece. And you lost two of them. It's $800. Why? Because a $25 fuse blew. And then your thruster doesn't work. And you needed your thruster. Because, you know, you had a big boat and it was windy. 
and now you crash in another boat, and now you're nervous. No, but it sounds silly, but there's a domino effect, right? Like planes don't fall out of the sky because they're shot at all the time. They fall out, one little thing happens, right? That's what happened in Brazil, right? right? It's a series of little things that happen, and then the plane falls out of the sky. That is a little thing that causes big problems. Battery combiners are good, but they have their limits. This is perfect. So how does the isolator deal with the different voltages in the different batteries? It doesn't. It's, it doesn't matter. It's looking at this here is looking at the output, and it, those are going to be both always parallel, always the same. They're always the same. They don't care. Yeah. But they don't, there's no such thing as one alternator that looks at two battery voltages. Yeah. It's assumed that it's one bank. You can, you would. You can have an external regulator on there. With, with the well, you would, you, because it would still make this alternator smarter. Right? Like, why not? Like a lot of Benetos, like the guy on the North Shore puts them all the time. You would put an external regulator on here. But you wouldn't need one. Well, you don't need one, but you don't need a boat. Well, I think maybe, maybe you do. <laughs> okay, let's, you know what, wrong crowd. Actually, no, no. You need a boat. And you might not need an external regulator, but you do need a boat. That was a bad, bad Jeff, bad Jeff. All right? Uh, the primary, the one that I care the most about. The house. Yeah. Remember, this is short term, right? Okay, people, right? Blogs, super dangerous, by the way. Super dangerous. Reason why I think blogs are dangerous? Because the people that are the loudest are generally the people that are the most wrong, by the way. So first thing, there's some people that have very little, a lot of time and are very information, um, they're disproportionate. They're the most prolific bloggers. They've played one round of golf in their lifetime or maybe actually a nine hole, mini putt. Maybe even a, just a nine iron course. And they are informing everyone how to play golf. They've owned a boat, maybe. Or they worked on a boat, a friend's boat, and they are absolutely, utterly convinced that because they played one round of golf, they're now going to teach everyone else how to play golf. And so you have to be very, very careful when you go on a blog to listen to the most vocal person about their opinion on how things could be wired. And especially related to this device and an alternator and where that sense could be. And that's why I used to do a lot of going on blogs, but at one point, I trust only certain authors now. Right? Like, I, I'll trust authors. Right? People that I believe are prolific. People that I look up to. But having someone that is just really loud does not mean they're actually knowledgeable. And you've got to be very careful, especially dealing with this and this and with the advice you're going to get on the internet. Yeah? So I'm not sure if I grasped your answer to the previous question. And you said... The house battery gets the... Battery banks are in parallel? Effectively, effectively, through a charging voltage, through this, only when this works. Right? Effectively. They're both going to see about the same voltage through this. This is your faucet. It's dumping water. The tanks are uneven. Eventually they're going to get to the same point. It's shooting for a voltage. That's what it does. This is like, I want the sink to be at 14.4 feet high. <sighs> Fill it. Like, just crazy. And until it senses that one of them gets to 14.4, this might get there sooner. But this will eventually get there, and once it, this gets to 14.4, then whatever this one is being monitored at, it will bring it down. But it, the faucet is full throttle. Think about two, literally, honestly, this is the way to look at it. You got two sinks. You got a divider in the middle, literally, like a normal sink. You got your faucet on top. Your water level is voltage. That's all it is. One, one sink is very empty. That's your house bank. It might be at 10 volts, 11 volts. The other faucet, other sink is at 12.8. It was pretty full. You start, you start the faucet full throttle. It hits the divider, and the divider is this device right here. 
Okay? Then water starts pluring on both sides. This side was already pretty full with, it's going to get to 14.4 very quickly. Right? But what happens is all the current, because this is going to be sucking more of it, more of it is going to go on this one. It's going to be sucking in more. This won't have the same amount of current as this battery because this one was lower. It's going to take more of it. And then they'll come up together, 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 until they get to about 14.4 or whatever voltage was set in that thing. And then they'll go through. And whatever you decided was going to get the external sense, if it was this one, they're going to live it together. And as soon as this stops working, they're separate. They'll never be together again. Oh yeah, absolutely they do. If if you have a what was deemed not necessary, just joking. <laughs> this device. If you have this device, your alternator will do bulk absorption flow. If you don't, your alternator does two-stage charging. A, an internal regulator does not do smart charging. Only an external regulator does. <coughs> yeah. So this is why this device is amazing. The batteries are effective. They're not, they're not seeing one another, but they have the same voltage while the alternator is on and working. Same, by the way, your charger is this device. This device is in your charger. That is in every charger now. Chargers don't look at multiple outputs. It's sort of like, honestly, it's almost like children. My fam first in the family, the rules were set for me, my brother had to follow. They're like, this guy's trouble, so the house was on like lockdown mode. There was no need to be locked down in my house if my brother was first. He was an angel, but I wasn't. So what you, the alternator does, the charger looks at battery post one on the charger. It says whatever is connected, imagine this is a charger with three posts and this is a negative ground. It says, whatever's on here is what I'm doing. And then I replicate whatever's on one, I replicate on two, and I replicate on three. And the voltage that one needs is what I'm doing voltage on two and three. There is no such thing as a charger that goes, oh, by the way, you've got a gluten allergy. Oh, you like protein a lot. And you want, I don't know, you are totally veg. I'm going to make a meal for three of you. It's like, no, no, we're cooking one meal. Everyone's eating the same meal. I don't care. It's one charger, one output. I'm going to do whatever one, want, one wants, and I'm, if two's connected, it's going to get what one wanted. And then three, they don't see one another, but they're getting the experience of number one. And that's how a charger works. So if your house battery needs a bulk charge, but your engine battery is on float, yeah. how do you not end up over Doesn't matter. And this is the difference between the internet and reality, because the bulk charging only lasts for a moment two, three, four, five hours, and then it's going to get to float. So you're right, your engine battery is going to be, but it's a compromise, right? You want to chase perfection, take out your wallet, prepare yourself for time. You'll never leave in this lifetime unless you have endless money. You send a team of people. Perfection, and that's the difference in reality between people in the blog sphere and the internet that give you all these things that can never be met, right? In an ideal world, every battery would have its own charger. But now, do you have room on your boat to put individual chargers for every battery? I've never seen it, by the way. But yeah, of course, if you had endless money, endless time, huge boat, lots of space on the wall, but big boats have more stuff on the wall. Even on a 100-footer, I got no place to put things on the wall. There's no end. A 150-footer engine room is full. The whole engine, I can't even mount anything. So it's not like I have ever space on a boat ever. There's just more stuff on a bigger boat. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it because the bulk is not going to last forever. It's going to last three, four hours. Won't matter. That's why you do want to have your batteries to be the same type, right? AGM, gel, flooded lead acid, because you can't change the profile. You're not saying AGM profile on lead post one, gel post two, lithium post three. You go all the same. Yeah, question? Does this AC charger work the same way? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The battery charger is the exact same thing. It's exactly what this does. So that does go through your DC alternator? Well, I mean, I'm giving you this output. If you want to conceptualize a charger is actually literally four posts, right? And this is normally the ground, but it does the exact same purpose of this, except this is fed by an alternator in, and a charger is fed by AC in. But ultimately, they do the same device. 
your posts on your charger are isolated from one another, but they're actually doing exactly what battery one wants to do. Yesterday, I emphasized this, right? Like, it's almost like it should be like, you should like keep this like photographic memory, like, oh, post one, house battery. If you put engine battery on post one, your house battery will never get what it needs because the charger is looking on post one, it's going, post one's an engine battery, it's perfectly fine. Your house battery is chronically undercharged. The house battery is the big battery bank, the ones that's expensive, the one that's really hard to replace, both in time, space, accessibility, all those factors come into play. That's why post number one is the most important thing. Now, how many people you think know that then install a battery charger on your boat? What do you think the probability is that your mechanic that's working on your boat has read a battery charger manual and he geeks out about this stuff? Extremely low. Right? How many boats where I go where the battery posts are completely random? 95, 98%. Nobody cares. But unrelated batteries are unreliable. Right? Unrelated, my electrical system in my boat never works. I'm always having failure. It's so frustrating. Boats are so frustrating. All those things are unrelated to the fact that it was not wired properly. If you do it properly, then things are reliable. Hence why yesterday I was telling my passion about electricity is actually deterministic. It's actually like plumbing. It's not magic. Electricity doesn't fly in the air to another one. It just, I mean, of course, lightning does, but you know, you get the point, right? It's, it's gonna stay contained within the wires. So battery isolators.